I sat down, took out some sheets of paper, and began with the first thing that occurred to me, without knowing what would follow, without any sort of plan. My characters will go about constructing themselves according to how they act and speak, above all, how they speak. Their personalities will form little by little, and sometimes their personality will be that of not having one. Miguel de Unamuno, Niebla. Hi there, and welcome back. Let's continue our journey through history's greatest novel. Roque's example of justice among thieves widens its scope when a coach and a group of travelers appear. They are headed for Barcelona and Roque orders his men to hijack them. While this blatant highway robbery takes place in the background, Don Quixote and Roque have an intense conversation. Roque confesses that he is morally misguided. He has chosen the life of a bandit because of a strange desire for revenge. Wanting to avenge myself of a certain grievance that was done to me, all my good inclinations come crashing to the ground and I persevere in this state over and against all that I know. Recalling the Parade of Saints in chapter 58, Roque here alludes to Paul, for what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Romans chapter 7, verse 19. On one hand, like Dante's Inferno, there are no gates keeping Roque in hell. It is his personal decision to remain there. On the other hand, there's something universal about how our collective desires for revenge can lead to anarchy. Just as one abyss calls forth another and one sin leads to the next, vengeances have been strung together in such a way that I now assume the weight not only of my own, but of others. The result echoes the encounter between Cardenio and Don Quixote in Sierra Morena. Another labyrinth needs a guiding light. Even though I find myself out in the middle of the labyrinth of my own confusions, I am not without hope of escaping and getting to a safe harbor. Don Quixote's response combines the Christian idea of salvation through penitence with the platonic metaphor of political advice as medicine. Your grace is ill, you know your sickness, and heaven, or I should say God, who is our physician, will apply medicines to you that will cure you, medicines that tend to cure little by little, not suddenly or by way of a miracle. Note Don Quixote's very modern swerve here away from miracles. Nevertheless, he tells Roque to join him and suffer the life of a knight errant because that way he can go straight to heaven. Roque changes topics by telling Don Quixote the story of Claudia Geronima, to whom Sancho was particularly attracted. Sancho's bias here is perhaps sexual, perhaps political. The beauty, confidence, and spirit of the girl had not seemed bad to him. At this point, the bandits arrive with their captives and everyone stands before Roque, the vanquished and the victors. The scene recalls Don Quixote's encounter with the Basque woman headed for Seville in chapter eight of part one, but it's more complex this time due to the presence of Roque, the diverse statuses and destinations of the travelers, and the intense monetary calculation that takes place regarding the booty. The hijacked party consists of two infantry captains on horseback, accompanied by two mule boys, then two pilgrims on foot, and finally a coach containing the wife of the regional governor of Naples, her daughter, a maid, a lady-in-waiting, and six servants. We learn their respective destinations and the amounts of money that they carry. The companies of the soldiers are in Naples, but they are headed to Sicily with 200 or 300 escudos. The pilgrims are headed to Rome with 60 reales. The women are headed to Naples with 600 escudos. Did you know? Cervantes was in Naples during the years 1570 to 75, during which he participated in the Battle of Lepanto, 1571, and the naval expeditions against Navarino, 1572, Corfu, Bizerte, and Tunis, 1573. 
What follows is one morally messy scene. Cervantes represents most of humanity here as thieves, and he unveils justice as a combination of hypocritical magnanimity and arbitrary brutality. Roque calculates the total booty at 900 escudos and 60 reales. Oddly, he asks others to calculate the division because I am bad at counting. Since he has 60 men, this makes for 15 escudos and one real for each of them. The men cheer him and call his enemies thieves. But when the hijacked party laments the confiscation of their wealth, Roque reigns in his thievery, making it something more like extortion. Euphemistically, he asks the soldiers and the magistrate's wife to loan him 60 and 80 escudos, respectively, promising them safe conduct to Barcelona, and he refuses to take anything from the pilgrims. Those being robbed now view Roque as a model of courtesy and liberalness, a kind of noble, considering him more an Alexander the Great than a well-known criminal. His division of the booty is weirder. Of the 140 escudos, he gives two to each of his men. Then he gives 10 to the pilgrims, and the final 10 to none other than Sancho, so that he will speak well of him. For all you anarchists out there, this sure does read like a mockery of the state as nothing but a bunch of robbers who pay moralists and commoners to support their cause. Although it seems random that Sancho should benefit here, perhaps this says something about the true nature of governors. To top all this off, when one of his squires makes a sarcastic comment that cuts to the issue of just whose property it is that Roque gives away, saying, this captain of ours would make a better friar than bandit. From now on, if he wishes to show himself liberal, let him do so with his own wealth and not ours. The bandit leader draws his sword, and in the blink of an eye, he almost split his head open in two parts. After this, Cervantes puns on this idea of parts. Roque separated himself and stood apart from the others and wrote a letter to a friend of his in Barcelona. Stranger still, the bandit writes to his friend that he will put Don Quixote on display on the beach in Barcelona as if he were merchandise for sale. He says his friend should notify the other Nierros and he laments the fact that their enemies, the Cadells, will also delight in Don Quixote and Sancho's presence. It's as if our heroes were now some sort of public good. They could not help but give general pleasure to everyone. Finally, a bandit who seamlessly transforms himself into a peasant escorts our heroes to Barcelona. Quixotic mission. What does Roque Gennard do to his impertinent lieutenant? A. He throws his shoe at his head. B. He shoots him in the stomach with his shotgun. C. He parts his head in two. Correct answer. C. He parts his head in two. In Chapter 61, Don Quixote and Sancho arrive in Barcelona after three days in the company of Roque, whose life consists of constant movement and paranoia, our heroes see the ocean for the very first time in their lives. Barcelona is preparing for the feast day of St. John the Baptist. The nobility and the military greet Don Quixote with trumpets and banners, and cannons fire salvos from the fortresses as well as the galleys. Roque's friend now arrives with other horsemen dressed in full regalia, and they all circle about Don Quixote. This symbolic gesture accompanies a loud welcome that distinguishes the hero and his original Moorish author from the apocryphal ones. Let the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha be welcomed, not the false one, not the fictional one, not the apocryphal one who has been shown to us recently in fake histories, but rather the true one, the legal one, the faithful one described for us by Cide Amete, that flower of all historians. Finally, some mischievous boys tie spiny shrubs to the tails of Rocinante and Sancho's ass, causing them to buck and throw our heroes to the ground. 
a triumphant entrance into Barcelona ends in comic shame. That's all for now. Keep reading. The story only gets better in the coming chapters. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.